Mike Rashid making his professional debut. He has been all about training his entire life, and now there's a lot of anticipation behind Mike Rashid's debut. He looks unbelievable aesthetically, but will it translate inside the ring? Fight day. I'm hit with a, a rush of anxiety. I'm thinking about all the people that flew out or drove down to see me. All the people that's watching on pay-per-view that spent money to see me. Ladies and gentlemen, making his pro debut, Mike Rashid Bay. What if I get knocked out? Why the fuck are you doing this? I come out, get into the ring. Obey the commands at all times. Protect yourselves at all times. I'm here for break. Give me the clean break. Touch gloves. Let's go to work. Touch them up. Beautiful. Everything starts to get quieter and quieter and quieter. I can't see anybody outside of this ring except for a man in the other corner. Let's go. You know, I'm an extremely confident person. I'm a fighter, you know? I grew up scrapping in the neighborhoods and got into boxing. You know, me working out and strengthening my body and all my weightlifting all through my life was to make me stronger as a fighter, as a more capable man. Honestly, I think training is a huge foundation in all of that. I can't tell you a time in my life that I didn't train, because it doesn't exist. Gym is a perfect place to practice, not just overcoming obstacles, but absolutely obliterating obstacles to where nothing's hard, nothing's difficult. I've always been in shape my entire life. You know, I've been active as a, since a kid, so the physical, this is second nature. This physical is a byproduct of me trying to constantly train my mind and running towards difficult tasks and handling it with ease. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York at a time that I like to call the cocaine 80s. Agents fighting the drug war in the streets say the big money is causing death and corruption. We intend to do what is necessary to end the drug menace and cripple organized crime. I, I was born into chaos because this was a time that uh, crack cocaine ran rampant through New York City. My mother, she was a single mother at the time. Her and my father weren't together. However, my mother did end up getting married uh, to <laughs> the biggest drug dealer in New York City. I was very aware of everything when I was young, probably more aware than I should have been. I was just conscious of things that, I, that kids seven, eight, nine years old shouldn't be aware of. I think subconsciously, that period of my life, it gave me a standard of who I am, right? When the dominant male in your life is the boss, you feel like you're the boss or you're supposed to be the boss. I don't know, I might have been eight, seven, eight, and her husband got murdered. So it was just me and her, and uh, everything went downhill from there. But I was protected. My mother was very protective of me. She, she kept me sheltered from a lot of the, uh, the, a lot of the atrocities that was all around us. 
you know, I, I give my mother all the credit in the world for that. My mother had some problems and she needed to get out of New York for a while, so she moved back to Florida where her family's from and I stayed in New York with my grandparents. And that was the best part of my, my childhood, my best memories. My grandfather, I mean, that was my best friend. He introduced me to boxing. Like, we used to watch Friday Night Fights. Every Friday night, me and Grandpa would sit in his room and watch the fights. And um, that just got me really into it. My father, you know, he had his issues that he had to work out, and he was living in Arizona. We would communicate a lot. We talked on the phone a lot. And my father sent me a pair of boxing gloves, just one pair. So I used to take them outside and box with kids. I would like keep the right glove and give them the left glove and just be banging everybody up. Bow, bow, bow. I, I started getting a little older. Then I moved to Arizona to live with my dad. I feel like it was a good transition from my mother nurturing me and giving me that love that a man can't really provide. And my grandparents just gave me so much love. And then my father came in and he started teaching me how to be a man. I was in Arizona, he was still in Brooklyn, and uh, I sent him the gloves. And I think that's what got him interested. The sweet signs, that's what we call it, the sweet signs. <laughs> Around 12 years old is when I started really taking boxing serious, 11 or 12. The discipline was very important. And I taught him, I said, the discipline is more important than what you're doing, going out there, working out, and challenging. I said, if you don't have the discipline to want to do it on your own, it's, it's useless. Don't do it for me. Do it for yourself. I was just a typical boy that wanted to be strong. First thing we did was start running up the mountain. I had him running up mountains, do sprints in the sand. And he always loved the challenge. And I would come up with more challenges for him. I was thin. I was a small kid. So it was even more pressure on me mentally to be strong. You know, if I can do 50 push-ups today, tomorrow I got to be able to do 51, 52. So I always gauged my performance to be better. It's always hard. Training is one of those things to where, the way I train at least, is always, it's always been progressive. So whether it be me being able to run a quicker mile the next week, lift more weights, do more reps at a certain weight, it kind of sucks that I'm so deep into training all my life that I got to do a lot extra to keep progressing. So no, it's not easy. I don't think it'll ever get easy. There's one of my philosophies that I live by is always doing things that make myself uncomfortable because I feel it keeps me sharp. It keeps me ahead of my competition. It gives me an edge. I need to go into that dark space to, to see who I am, you know? And it, it reaffirms that I am who I think that I am. In 2000, when I stopped fighting, um, you know, just trying to find my way. So I had an uncle that, uh, you know, is a big time, big time guy as a street pharmaceutical <laughs> peddler. So I used to help him out, you know, just do little things for him. And then I told him, you know, I figured out his, his game. And I'm like, he's making that much money and it's that easy? I'm gonna do this. So with the money I was making from him, I just started saving and saving and saving and uh, until I had enough to buy my own stuff and ship it out and start my own business. I've never seen any parallels between my mother's husband and myself because 
Maybe because I had such little involvement with him. My decisions were based on me being a risk, the risk taker that I am. When I was really making all of that money, I wasn't happy and I wasn't comfortable. And I kind of justified my actions by the fact that I was taking care of certain people and trying to do the right thing with the money. But at the end of the day, wrong is wrong. And one night, I come home, someone breaks into my house, my home. I hop out the car, have my gun behind my back. And I'm like, hey, can I help you? And he says, can I help you? I said, what are you doing? He says, my dad lives here. I said, is that right? He said, what's behind your back? And then I came around and he, he ran into my house. Do you feel comfortable telling the story of after the guy ran into the house? Nah, okay. it's something I gotta live with, so. Police came and seemed like everything was fine. So they started asking me questions and I'm answering everything honestly. Did he charge you? I'm like, nah, when he saw my pistol, he ran. Did he, he had his gun with him, right? Like, like I didn't, I don't know, I didn't see it. He shook his head and said, any of my guys would have did the same thing you did. But in the state of Arizona, you gotta match force with force. You have the right to remain silent. In hindsight, he was trying to help me, and I wasn't answering properly. I was answering truthfully, but, uh, you know. And then 10 days later, they dropped the case. And then about a year later, my ex and I were out celebrating a friend's birthday. You know, I got jumped, uh, but I handled myself properly, knocked one of them out. The other one ran. Next thing I know, my door fly open and people are grabbing me out of my car. And I had my pistol. I said, get out of here, leave me alone, whatever. And uh, closed the door and got out of there. All of a sudden, bam, I got another charge. They profiled me and they, they were pretty accurate at the time of being a bad guy. People I was affiliated with and why does he have this money? He's not employed, and this, that, and the third. So I hired an, an attorney and started trying to fight the case, and it was not looking good at all. Make a long story short, I said, you know what? I'm out of here. I ran. I abscounded from justice. No one in my life knew that I was a fugitive, that I had a case, and any of that. Maybe one or two people. I've gotten some messages from people who knew you or you trusted just to say you're all right, you know? And that was comforting. And uh, it, it was a hard time for me too, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I know it was a hard time for you. Yeah. But I, I kind of knew that it'll come to some type of a head, which it did. To carry around a secret that big was literally the equivalent of walking around with a dark cloud every day. It kind of killed some of the enthusiasm and joy that I used to have. At my lowest point, I had no money. For a while, you know, I mean, I was homeless and I had that dark cloud over my head this impeding truth that at any moment, I can get stopped. I'm gonna just put this little jewel out there for anybody who care to listen. I started building my first business in this world when I was homeless, without any help, with money that I was making saving for my nine to five, not making much. You know, but I made it happen. I, I would not succumb to my circumstance at that time. YouTube, everything, all came out of a space. I was homeless. Nobody knows that. All right, so
to the elbow for three minutes straight, and I stopped punching on the heavy back. I was the crazy dude making plans for my future when the future was bleak. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Checking in with you from Metro Flex. We're training chess. I built two of my businesses as a fugitive. I just released a whole line of uh, supplements. Yo, what's going on, everybody? I'm one day out at WBFF Worlds. Look, when you're lifting, you go till you can't go no more. You make the weight difficult, and you get as many reps as you can. When you feel it burning, then that's when it's really tearing into the muscles. That's when it's starting to work. You guys, man, <laughs> these excuses kill me. You have excuses in the gym, you're gonna have excuses everywhere. You're, you're gonna have problems in life. So message I wanna give to my son. Uh, basically, whatever you wanna do in life, you do it. My only request is that whatever you choose to do is helpful to people, is beneficial to society. I've realized how easy things leave you when you obtain them the wrong way. So I was steadfast on obtaining as much as I can the right way. Nobody's taking that. No one's taking that. So back in 2013, this is at Metroflex Long Beach. If you notice, you'll see our gym is covered with graffiti, with artwork, urban artwork. This was our first piece right here. At the time, I was right a co-owner of the gym. We love Long Beach. We are Long Beach. I still had these unresolved issues that nobody knew about. So I was always on alert. I never knew when it was the day that they was gonna come get me. And keep in mind, this is when I've already built a growing empire in a positive space. So a guy walks into the gym. He just was out of place. He didn't fit. So I spoke to him. He got very uncomfortable when I spoke to him. He was like nervous. I was like, that's weird. So about three minutes later, here they come. The cavalry, the boys, the US Marshals. Even though the outcome could have been bleak, I was relieved when they came. Six years is a long time of obsessing with a certain thought because today could be the last. I wanted to thank the guy, as weird as that sounds. The first thing he said is, uh, you're a very motivational person and you do a lot of good for a lot of people. Just get this behind you and move on with your life. And I said, thank you. But in my head, I'm like, get this behind me. I'm about to be in prison. They had me in there with the worst of the worst. It was literally the personification of, of what you think hell is. I was in there with the people that society doesn't know exists, people that nobody cares about. Well, you know, it affected the family, you know. We was drastically affected because you know, we was always in touch, close proximity to you. But I know that was a difficult time in your life because me and your mom used to be up at night worrying, but you know, like mo most parents would, you know, but I also comforted her to let her know that you're a survivor, you, you'll handle it. They had me in the max security with no concept of time. It can drive you insane. And my mind was, okay, I'm here. Now, let me figure this out. Let me figure everything out. I'm a survivor and I make the best out of every situation. I wasn't gonna let this situation conquer me. I knew that me being there, it was a lesson, it was a reason. And I don't think people are born good or evil, but your conditions can shape you and to be one or the other. And of course, the majority of what's shaped in a place like prison is evil, is darkness, is, is, is anger, is, is bad. It's a scary place. You know, I was a target because I appeared to be the most formidable guy. When something pops off, everybody's gonna try to jump me. You know what I'm saying? That's how it works. 
so people automatically try to give me some leadership positions. And I was like, no thanks, I'm not here for that. All my friends, I'm usually like the dad, you know what I mean? I'm always on everybody about everything. And sometimes I have to pull back because I feel like I'm being a little bit too much. And that's probably because I have my dad on me like that. I would be talking to guys when they're about to get ready to go to war. And I'm like, you really want to fight? I know people that went in for petty crimes ended up doing seven, eight, nine years. They kept getting into fights. I mitigated a lot of the violence in there. And I talked sense into a lot of people. And they'd be like, I never even thought of it like that. If I would've went in there like a tough guy, everybody's gonna test me. If I would've been in there timid and weak, everybody's gonna take advantage of me. So it was a fine line you gotta walk. And I feel like that's, that line is, is pretty consistent with regular life. I'm gonna tell you about a time that a little kid saved my life. I actually spoke to Elijah once. I was on the phone with his mom, and she put him on the phone. And I told everybody, don't tell the kids anything. So say I'm in the hospital. And uh, so I spoke to him. I didn't want to speak to him. And he, he's like, Dad, can you secure your leg so you can come to my birthday party? <sighs> Man. Just got me right here, bro. Just tears just start streaming. <sighs> Being incarcerated felt like the longest period of my life. I mean, ultimately, you, you have no choice but to adapt. I mean, there's no alternative. But a survival mechanism is hope. Yo, what's up? It's your boy Mike Rasheed, live and direct. Fresh from the wilderness. That's why I got all this facial hair right now. <laughs> your boy went through some very trying times, but I'm back. Bigger, better, stronger than ever. Much love to everybody who, who supported me and all my friends who have my back. What does not kill me makes me stronger. I got out of jail because I was given a bond like a half million dollars or something like that. It was relief on our part because we knew we could get him back home. And uh, they brought him back home. And then from there, we worked on his case. My initial meeting with my lawyer was very comforting. What it felt like was after school, I got to fight somebody that's bigger and tougher than me and my big brother was there to help me. That's what it felt like, I wasn't alone. The defense team and the prosecution team are always meeting to try to come up with a deal with some kind of meet and middle ground, right? To where both sides are happy. They go back and forth and I remember one time, the first case, the prosecutor offered them, you know, no jail, probation. And my lawyer slid the paper off the table and walked out. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, let's do that. You know what I mean? He's like, no, I'm going to make them work. Every time we had court, the deals would get better and better. They finally came to a, a deal that I was OK with, you know? And it was, you know, just three years of probation and anger management class. I said, I'll do it. The only bad thing about the plea is you're admitting to guilt. Everybody knows that when people accept the plea, they're just doing it to end the process and to not get a very harsh sentence. Even though that doesn't 100% protect you, the judge has the ultimate say. They cannot honor it. They can say, nah, I don't like this. So the judge said, you know what, Mr. King? If this was closer to the time that this incident occurred, you'd be getting sent to prison right now. 
but the court sees that you are not a criminal. I'm only gonna give you two years of probation. Get out of my courtroom. And I was like, wow. I had a moment to think about that dark cloud that's been over my head for the past seven, eight years. It's gone, poof. And it was weird because I kind of missed it for a minute. That dark cloud has been there and now it's gone. So that was an interesting feeling. That time deeply embedded a powerful attribute in me of living every day like it's my last. And I appreciate that. When we're developing strength and character, the process of that development is painful and uncomfortable. Lifting weights, painful and uncomfortable. But the end result, you're stronger at the end of the day. So that was just a, a, an exercise in developing certain qualities that helped me get to the success. All right, it's just Q&A time. The first question, how do you personally deal with negativity, failure, stress, etc.? You know, we all have our shit that we deal with, but you know what? We can't lay down to it. Shit, keep it real, six months ago, I was going through, I was fighting for my freedom, <laughs> you know? A lot of y'all don't know this, or some do. I had a period, like a grace period, <laughs> like a five-year grace period, let's say, and I felt like I was given an opportunity to either keep fucking up or grow the fuck up. And I grew the fuck up. And, um, you know, all of that is behind me now and life is great, you know what I mean? I'm a millionaire now, right? And it, it took me, it took me a, a little bit of time, but that's the American dream, ain't it? To have freedom. It's not just the money, it's the freedom, you know what I mean? The freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Listen, I lay out a blueprint, and I've been doing that for, since day one. Now, I'm not saying that my exact method is going to work for the next person. However, what will work is the same thing I've been preaching since day one. Be good at what you do. Your product or your service has got to be good. That's the underlying key to success. Constantly try to qualify yourself in your field. When I was a personal trainer, I had three certifications. I only needed one. What else? And be super fucking consistent. Consistency is, I mean, there's people who are not super talented that are super consistent and, and have uh, discipline, and they're good. They, they'll excel past talented people who are lazy. So you gotta be consistent and disciplined. My circumstance was fucking shitty. It don't matter. That's why I don't listen to people's excuses. I'm like, okay. Yeah, okay, your girlfriend left, okay, whatever. That's the beautiful thing about this country. There's a lot of debate going on about this and that. I don't care about any of that. What I love about America is that anybody can fucking make it. And the shittier your situation is, and you get out of it, it's a cooler story, <laughs> you know? All right, so just lean, just flow, less power. Okay, you're a big dude, the power comes from behind it. Stay in the pocket, when you let go of it, just nice and straight. Boom, boom, boom. Right there. Can I say with a cross or cross at the end? Yeah. Okay. What's unique to me as a boxer is this. I started as a boxer first. Then I took this long break from boxing. And then I got deeper into lifting. And I was never the biggest guy. Still not but I always wanted to be the strongest guy. If I can't control how my size, I can control how strong I am. I never not done some kind of boxing in some capacity. So I got it, I still got it. I got a question for you. When I said I was gonna take a pro fight, did you think I was really gonna do it, honestly? What made me, what convinced me was Elijah. Mm. Because you, you gave him your word you was gonna do it. Mm. So Elijah has been training for about two years with boxing. 
He hasn't fought yet, but he has sparred, and it was nerve-wracking. The first kid he sparred, you know, was they were the same age, but the kid was shorter than him, and Elijah just beat him up, and I wasn't satisfied with that. See, one thing about my children is they happen to have been born into privilege. I wasn't. I fought growing up, it was rough, it was just different. They don't have that. So he needs adversity. He's gonna find it with this hard training, with sparring, bigger kids, whatever. He needs to get punched in the face. It's hard to say that about your own child, but I want him to experience it and conquer it so he's confident and have no fear. Good, now look, when this ain't go time, you, you go in until you can't no more, until you physically can't, until your arm fall off or your hand fall off. That's not gonna happen, all right? People fight with broke hands, broke jaws, all of that. Both people are gonna get tired, but the guy who shows it is at a disadvantage. So I'm on the phone with a friend. I was in the process at the time of applying for my promoter's license and my, my license to manage fighters. And I just have this weird thing to where it's hard for me to partially be involved in something. I gotta go all in. I gotta be that ultimate practitioner. So I asked him like, what if I turned pro? What if I fought, took a couple fights? And my son was right here and his eyes lit up and he got excited. So I said, you want me to fight? You want me to turn pro? He was like, yeah, 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 please, 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 please. I said, I, I didn't even think about it. I said, okay, I'll do it. Y'all the first to hear it. I'm turning pro at 40 years old. It's not a thing, people don't do that. People retire before 40. Will I get fucked up? No. <laughs> Will I lose? It's a possibility, but I don't even, it's not about that. It's about me doing something very difficult, going, returning to a passion of mine, a love of mine, and just going all the way in. This is something that you gotta understand. When I had him boxing, when he was an amateur, I was his coach and I was his dad. I didn't wanna see my son get hurt. It was hard to separate coach and father. And the same thing stands for now. I don't wanna see my son get hit, even though he's a grown man. Nice. Yeah. Hey, hey. One of my favorite philosophies is actually a quote from Lao Tzu. He who defines himself doesn't really know who he is. There's been so many different times in my life that I thought I was this and I stood for that. So I test myself and I do things to keep myself uncomfortable to help shape me to be the person that I want to be. And I can never tell you who I am. That's for you to determine. You know, perceptions and perspectives change as we change every day, as we grow, we should be changing. So I never lock myself into, I am this or I am that. I'm just me living and learning each day. Anybody out there can say how great they think they are. But the person that you cannot lie to is you. When you look in the mirror at night, are you full of shit or are you legit? I get criticized for so much just for being good at certain things. I'm 41, right? I started amateur boxing at 12. I've been active since then. So that's almost 30 years of running, punching, lifting, pull-ups, being active, being competitive extremely competitive since I was 12 years old. But people just, they don't see that. Maybe because they just started training six months ago or a year ago or, or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I just happen to be at this for 30 years. 30 years. Longer than some of these people criticizing me have been alive. Mike Rashid making his professional debut. He has been all about training his entire life, and now there's a lot of anticipation behind Mike Rashid's debut. He looks unbelievable aesthetically, but will it translate inside the ring? Fight day. 
and I'm hit with a rush of anxiety. Why the fuck are you doing this? Will the muscles and will the power being in the gym translate to actual competition? I've never felt this before. Cause I've never fought as a professional boxer. I've never fought with gloves these small. I've never fought without headgear protecting me. I'm not letting him hurt me. Obey the commands at all times, protect yourselves at all times. When I come for the break, give me the clean break. Touch gloves, let's go to work. This is real. This shit is real right now. Let's go. I'm stalking, I'm taking my time being strategic. Oh, you hit me with a hard right? Okay, it's over for you. Okay, I can get that in. Wow, same thing. Right hand right over the top and it's over. And that was it. Your winner by knockout and now undefeated from scottsdale arizona and brooklyn new york mike rashid king mike rashid king victorious here tonight i wouldn't change anything honestly you know my past is all positive to me I'm happy where I am now, you know? I have such a appreciation for very simple things, for life, for freedom, for, for being able to smile, for being happy. I've been taught some valuable lessons. I learned a lot of lessons with my upbringing, my past. So it doesn't negatively affect me at all. It's all positive. And I have a saying, only good things happen to me. Everybody can apply that. It's good or bad, it's all a perception. Looking at everything negatively does not benefit anybody. We're all gonna go through shit that appears to be bad or negative. We're all gonna have mountains to climb. It's on you if you're gonna be like, man, this is too high, it's cold, I can't do it, I'm gonna cry. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna keep trying until I get over it. And when you get over it, you're that much stronger, you're that much better. Your aptitude as a person grows. You develop ineffable qualities that can't be taken away from you. The winner of wars is who write history, you know? So us going to battle every day, taking on tasks, conquering them, we write that history. I am constantly writing my book. You know, it's a, it's a big book. The book ain't finished until we close the casket. And I do this for my kids. I, I, I go all out for my kids. So their kids can be like, my grandpa was a beast. I want them to be proud of me, you know? And it's, it's legacy. My grandkids will see my entire life. So I gotta put on a hell of a show. The program is a hybrid training system that I've designed specifically for you. This will change your life, but you gotta sign up to find out how. 